Okay. We're now live. All right. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Wherever you're listening in, you're most welcome to uh, this live broadcast, launching our report. Um, my name is Hamimo Masudi. I'm the Minority Rights Group International Media Officer for Africa. And I welcome you warmly to this show. And thanks for signing up uh, to listen to some of our findings and case studies that we are about to be sharing with you. And also to discuss, have some kind of a, a roundtable discussion with some of our experts, people out in the field who have been interacting with some of the issues and are able to give us their field experiences. So thank you very much. Uh, with me to discuss this issue of, of um, mobile technologies, or generally what we'd call technologies and how they are impacting uh, lives of minority, what we could say this, the disenfranchised communities all over Africa. Um, Definitely, we have uh, very many communities along that line, along that perspective. We have pastoralist communities occupying most of the parts here in Africa, the Horn of Africa, here in East Africa, but also in the Sahel, Lake Chad region. We also have indigenous um, communities, the forest um, people. Our examples include the Batwa of Rwanda, Kenya and the Democratic Republic of Congo, rather, and, uh, and Uganda. Of course, we have the Bennett of Mount Elgon here in Uganda, and um, the Sanguer and Ogiek of Kenya, and several others, including the Sun of the Kalahari Desert in Southern Africa. Those are some of the communities we are talking about, and uh, they're the ones we want to uh, share with you some of the experiences they are facing when it comes to uh, their interaction with technologies. With technologies, we mean um, it's a wide spectrum of technologies, including assisted technologies like wheelchairs, but also uh, mobile technologies, including ICTs, but also electric vehicles, the ones that don't use uh, fossil fuels. We're also talking about social media, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, name them. So it's a wide spectrum of technology that we're discussing here. So with me on this show, uh, five experts to help me in dissecting this subject and responding to some of the questions that you may try. First, we have Berhan Tyre from Access Now. Berhan Hai is the, the Africa policy manager and um, yeah, and uh, a coordinator for what happens online here in Africa. So you're most welcome, Tai. Then we have Alain Wikani from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Alain is a conflict and humanitarian journalist based in Democratic Republic of Congo. He has worked uh, deeply on issues to do with conflict, but also on issues to do with humanitarian. So he interacts a lot with uh, some of the communities that are affected or are impacted by, by the technologies. Then we have Olive Namtebi. Olive Namtebi is the executive director of uh, the umbrella for albinism in Uganda. You're most welcome, Olive. Then we have Geoffrey Kerosi. Geoffrey is a coordinator here in East Africa for Minority Rights Group International. So he reaches out to most of the countries in East Africa, in Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, and uh, definitely the Congo. With me to support me technically, but also to make sure this show is successful, is Sam Rawit. Sam Rawit is based in London, and she is making sure that this uh, broadcast goes on live and receives all your questions. 
So everyone who's watching us on Facebook, please, you're most welcome. And we're happy to have you share your screen, share what you're doing with the rest of your network so that they can also join in and also learn from uh, some of the, uh, the outcomes of our report. We will do, invite you to ask questions on the comment section on, this, on, the, on the Facebook, on our Facebook page, Minority Rights Group International. Write some questions as, uh, as we progress with the discussions. And then Sam Rawit will uh, be happy to come in and ask these questions at some point. So thank you very much and you're most welcome and we're ready for the show. First, I'm going to call Geoffrey Kerosi. Geoffrey, tell us something about uh, minority rights, indigenous communities. What are the experiences, the different challenges they face? Tell us more about the experiences with technologies. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes for that. Over to you, Geoffrey. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you everyone who has joined us for this webinar. As uh, my colleague has said, my name is Geoffrey Kerosi. I work for Minority Rights Group International. We are in, in East Africa, coordinating some projects. So basically I'm sharing uh, some of the experiences that our community partners have uh, in the field, more especially during this time of the pandemic, which has brought forward the issue of uh, use of technologies and access to those technologies uh, for these communities wherever they are based. So basically in most of our projects at MRG, we are focusing uh, more on promoting uh, dignity, uh, that is access to uh, human rights, more especially economic, social and cultural rights here in Africa and beyond. Uh, we have three, uh, actually, um, working directly in three main projects, uh, which are promoting dignity and also promoting um, participatory research to make sure that the, com the minorities and indigenous communities we are working with uh, can be able to collect the data and also have positive dialogues with government in order to influence policy making processes. So we are working with a number of communities here in Kenya. Uh, we have the Ogiek, the Endorois, the Sengwel. We have also indigenous communities like the Maasai, Turkana people, and others. One of the uh, things we will focus more on for the case of this uh, uh, webinar is how these communities are using technologies or failure thereof. So basically, in most of the communities which we are working with, as much as they are based in rural areas, they are also some of their members based in urban areas. So for the purpose of this discussion, I will focus more on those working in rural areas, because that is where there is a deficit of technologies uh, when it comes to accessing basic services, such as healthcare and education. So the first one being uh, maybe use of uh, internet, uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic outbreak, we discovered that internet is an essential part of life and we should actually uh, have universal access to internet, but which is not the case as we speak. Because most of the community groups that we are working with, they do not have access to internet uh, because you know internet is uh, in, in most parts of Africa, is begged on access to telephone networks. So you find, for example, here in Kenya, some parts, uh, like some parts of Turkana, uh, some parts of uh, the Ogiek people where they stay, there is no uh, mobile telephone network coverage. So you find it is very difficult to, co to communicate with these partners or for those partners to document and disseminate uh, human rights violations from the ground. Uh, and this has come to the fore during this time of the pandemic when we cannot be able to communicate back and forth with the community partners. The other issue which these communities are facing is access to 
assistive technologies, more especially for people with a disability. They do not have access to, uh, for example, wheelchairs uh, for those who are physically, uh, those who have physical um, disability. They do not have access to wheelchair and most of them in some communities, they are even kept at home uh, because they cannot be able to move around, especially during this time of uh, pandemic where we are practicing social distancing. Uh, the other challenge which they are, uh, they are also experiencing is access to resources, considering that in Kenya, for example, we have uh, access to mobile telephony uh, or mobile networks which is very key in terms of these people accessing uh, money transfer, that is mobile money transfers, uh, considering that most banks are not there in those rural and remote areas. So that is a challenge which is caused by lack of relevant technologies. The other issue which is caused by lack of technologies is uh, access to some of the government services uh, because in most uh, most countries, people have to be registered. Uh, they must have birth certificates. They must have uh, identification cards or passports for them to access services such as education and healthcare. So you find because of the distance which they need to travel to register for birth certificates, uh, you find that some of them, when they uh, they grow up or, or they become adults and they do not have birth certificates uh, or identification cards, they cannot be able to access some of the te technologies. For example, mobile you can't uh, operate the mobile phone uh, if you do not have an ID card to use it to register uh, those SIM cards which are used in mobile phones. So having a mobile phone uh, also depends on whether you have or you are registered in a country. Uh, so it, it is a, a problem which, um, which uh, actually the government sh governments in East Africa should look at uh, whether we should continue denying these uh, minority communities the basic services because they lack registration documents. Uh, one of the major theme that we are focusing on uh, is uh, identifying discrimination in policy, law, and practice. We have seen even if we, uh, if we, for example, we use the example of COVID-19 measures, which we have seen and we have also researched about, uh, is that most of the sensitization conducted by government agencies, including Ministry of Health in various uh, countries, uh, they have, or they normally do this sensitization about COVID-19 uh, just by speaking about uh, what the people need to do or to follow in, in public televisions or in radio shows. But people who with disability among us, these communities are unable to get that information because they do not have those relevant technologies which can enable them, uh, for example, uh, get that information. That is one of the challenges uh, our community partners are facing, uh, more especially here in East Africa government agencies are not using sign language more frequently. They are not producing most of that content uh, to be relevant for uh, people with visual impairment uh, or even putting subtitles in those videos uh, we see online from government agencies so that those who cannot hear or who have hearing impairment can be able to understand uh, what they should do for them to, uh, to protect themselves from uh, infections from uh, COVID-19. Um, finally, I will talk about access to some of the technologies which are available in urban areas. Uh, for example, we have uh, use of mobile phones in what we call the medicine, which is really available in urban areas where uh, most families or most people have access to smartphones because it actually depends on uh, talking directly to your doctors uh, through use of smartphones that is online. So you find those people uh, who are staying in remote areas, they will not be able to get access to those services because they do not have network coverage. So basically those are some of the highlights of the issues facing uh, 
minorities and indigenous peoples here in East Africa uh, with a focus more on what is MRG doing. Thank you very much. Back to you, Amim. Thank you very much, Geoffrey, for that uh, comprehensive um, uh, explanation of what Minority Rights Group International is all about and some of the challenges the communities are facing. So next on the agenda would be that um, I'll just um, share with you some of the findings from our report. But a small background about this report, we call it the Key Trends Report. It's an annual report. It comes out every, every year. And previously we've covered very many subjects from climate change to you know, other discriminatory subjects like pastoralism and, um, and the rest. So this year, because of what was going on around us, we saw that uh, technologies actually were enabling the realization of rights. Many people were coming online. Everyone was using technologies to solve some of the challenges they are facing in life. But then we realized that some of our communities that we work with are being left behind. So the indigenous communities that Joffe just mentioned, like the Batwa and the Ogiek, we are being left behind, partly because of access, but most of the time because of their geographical location. Most of them are remote based. Then we also realized that government policies were also not helping matters. We also realized that, that for these communities to access this, and rather to get online, for example, on social media, they need more than a policy. They need some infrastructure to be put in place. In places where they live, they survive, there's no electricity. Okay, some of the things that everyone takes for granted. In places where they live, you know, it's hard to own a mobile phone gadget, a smartphone, some of the things that we are taking for granted. So I wanted to diverge into this whole issue and uh, study, get some case studies that we can share with the rest of the world, the policymakers, but also with the general um, uh, public so that we, we know what is happening with the other section of the public, of the community. So the findings are as follows. We went to Cameroon in Central Africa, that's the Great Lakes region of Africa. And um, there are communities that we work with, they are the indigenous communities, the Baka. They are facing a very big challenge. They gain most of their livelihood from the environment, from their forests, from the rivers, and from everything that surrounds them. But the challenge they are facing is that these resources are being encroached on illegally. So there's a lot of logging illegally that is being done. There's a lot of extractive industries that are encroaching on their resources. And most of these resources are being destroyed. And definitely that is threatening their survival. So among the Baka indigenous communities of Cameroon, we realized that actually for them, they've already understood their plight and they are having a solution around it. And that solution is the use of an application, a mobile application that helps them to map their environment, but also be able to report some of the infractions, some of the encroachments onto their lands to law enforcers and in the process, try to preserve the environment. That was in Cameroon, but it's just a case study for Cameroon. We know that happens a lot. In, in, in the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, that's happening day in, day out. We're having very many encroachments on forests. And uh, the Batua, the, the Tua communities, the Bambute are being affected. So this is just a small case study. But the, case, the, pro, the plight, the problem is widespread across Central Africa and also the Great Red region. The second um, finding has to do with uh, 
cobalt mining. Of all things, cobalt mining. That should be something good for the communities, but it's proving to be an issue for the rights of some people. And these people are children. So in the Congo, cobalt is being mined using child labor. And there are also lots of human rights violations, which definitely need to be stopped. So what we found out is that child labor is being used to extract that mineral. Cobalt mining is an important mineral. Rather, the, the mineral itself is very important in the manufacture of most of the technologies that we are using. So most of us don't know the smartphones that we have in our hands, the laptops before us, but also those who are using electric vehicles. We don't know that up to 60% of the battery that is used to power those gadgets is made up of cobalt. And that cobalt comes from Congo. So in terms of human rights abuses, we are looking at extraction of resources that are being used in the manufacture of these technologies. So that is the finding that we found uh, in, uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And luckily enough, we have the expert here, person who has been watching and monitoring this situation. Elaine will be sharing more about this. The third uh, issue, rather finding that we, we came across is what Geoffrey mentioned a little about, the issue of uh, telecommunication. So communities that are living in um, arid communities like the Turkana are having lots of challenge. There's global warming and it is destroying most of the environment. The Akato cannot find water to drink. There's no pasture. And uh, because of this, these communities are being exposed to some of the worst challenges of food insecurity. And most of them are starving. The children are malnourished. It's uh, an issue that is on top of almost every humanitarian organization. They always like put it, they mark it somewhere that during this month, our focus will be on Turkana because there's going to be no food for people. Those animals are going to die. And they, they always plan to do some kind of relief work. So what we discovered is that there is um, the, the, the actors on ground, like Red Cross, are using smartphones eh, to transfer funds to rescue some of these communities. So we are saying this is a good practice. And uh, we think it's worth being spread so that policymakers, wherever they are, they take this to scale so that we can stop some of the suffering that we are experiencing among communities such as those of the Turkana. Then finally, there's the issue of uh, discrimination of people with albinism. So we went to Tanzania and studied what is happening there. And what we found is that offline, people with albinism are facing challenges. Them as a community who have an issue with their skin, it's being misunderstood. And uh, it's being used to discriminate against them to the extent that some people think that if you have a body part of some of the one of the person who lives with albinism, it is something that can infer luck on you or that can solve some of, so it's some kind of superstition. And that has been an issue for people with albinism in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So there is a lot of stigma that they face offline on the streets in the communities. They are hunted down. They are being disaggregated. They can't access education. Some of the things that we take for granted, they can't go to school because it's not safe. So they, most of them are missing out on some of the, uh, the human rights that we, every person is enjoying. So what we found out is that these same discriminations are being transferred online. So when they come online, 
they are being faced by the same stigmatization. They are being profiled easily and they're being hunted down easily using the mobile phone uh, technologies. So on this call, we are privileged to have uh, Olive, who has been doing immense work here in Uganda and also in the region in terms of sensitizing people about the whole issue of uh, albinism. She will be diverging much about this. So in summary, those are some of the cases that relate to us here in Africa. There are several other cases that we, we, we recorded, some from as far as China, India, Southern America, America itself. But for today, because of time, we shall only work on the ones that uh, are relevant to us. So these are the findings that um, we are here to discuss more and also to hear from the experts. Most of them have interacted with these issues on their own in their work and they have a lot of insights and uh, recommendations on how we can uh, you know, make life better for some of the most disenfranchised uh, people amongst us. So we shall now go for a discussion and um, I want to invite uh, Berhan Tai, the African policy manager and the global internet shutdown lead at Access Now. You have done a lot of work online in terms of uh, handling issues of uh, hate speech, handling issues of violence online, and definitely we are, uh, are looking forward to hear about your experiences and uh, some of the insights that uh, you think we should take on board both us here as MRG, but also as policymakers. So Berhane, over to you. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, and that, that analysis actually is, is quite scary you know, to hear that um, what we're seeing, you know, uh, what minority groups are um, experiencing offline has moved to the, to the online world and we as Access Now are a digital rights organization that specifically focus on digital rights and specifically focusing extra on users at risk. So individuals that, you know, um, that users at risk are the ones that are that are facing a lot of problems online, uh, specifically for, for, from our angle. So, uh, you know, un unfortunately the, the, the reality is that, you know, technology is not neutral. Um, so it exasperates the already existing inequalities in the world. So the structural violences that we're seeing now and the many issues that you and your colleagues were talking about uh, when, you know, when it comes into the online space or when technology is introduced doesn't necessarily mean that things are going to get better. It actually means that technology will exasperate the already in exist ex existing, you know, structural and, and, and inequalities that we're seeing. And this is what's uh, you know, precisely visible here, specifically when you're mentioning the case in, in, in Tanzania and specifically with, um, with people uh, being discriminated online as well, uh, specifically you know, um, folks. So what we're seeing uh, from our end is that, you know, this is not just to say that you know, technology is all bad. That's not necessarily the case. You know, uh, many people have been able to find their voices online, um, you know, as we're sitting here today, for instance, in Nigeria, there's a there's a massive protest that has been organized mostly online and offline as well. The NSARS movement. If we look at the Bring Back Our Girls movement in Nigeria, Bring Back Our Internet, Keep It On campaign, you know, um, uh, the Oromo protest in Ethiopia, many of these things were organized online, right? And Facebook, um, Twitter, and other social media platforms have managed to give both you know, um, uh, you know, ordinary folks, but minorities, import importantly, the, the space and the, the medium to engage in, and, you know, for, for them to be able to raise their voice. So, you know, I, I always want to put that as a caveat because the tech evangelist will come and say, oh no, technology is not all bad, you know, has done some good, yes, it, you know, I'm not trying to deny the good, the good things that technology has done. But on the flip side, you know, um, when, when you really look at, you know, the, the ways that technology has exasperated the already existing inequalities, um, we're, at, we're at actually a very dangerous um, crossroad right now. So um, if you look at what recently happened in Ethiopia, um, you know, specifically on social media targeting of, uh, you know, my, both minority and majority groups online, um, you know, the hateful content that was being posted, uh, you know, uh, violence inciting content, um, you know, um, it's quite dangerous to an extent where um, you know a lot of us disagree on what exactly happened in Ethiopia in the past few weeks, especially in June and July, because of the the, the strong different narratives and then you know uh, content that was that was that was online. 
um, you know, so minority groups were targeted uh, using uh, social media platforms. They were pushed off social media platforms. They were, um, you know, there were content that was trying to incite violence, that were trying to discriminate against individuals. So that is extremely, extremely scary and extremely dangerous as well. So the other part, you know, the flip side of that is, uh, you know, who's responsible for, you know, for making sure that content is moderated in, in a human rights respecting way, right? Like, so you have governments as one entities that are responsible for the protection of minority groups, but then also the businesses, you know, um, the, the Facebooks, the Instagrams, which are the same company uh, one way or another, Twitter, you know, Google and others are also responsible. They have, with, especially if you look at the UN business and human rights principles, um, and, you know, and of course, international law and many other things, they have the responsibility, um, actually a very grave responsibility on their hands to make sure that their tools and platforms are not being used to discriminate against the most vulnerable groups around the world. And unfortunately, uh, from these social media platforms, um, there's a massive lack of response. And to an extent, you know, I'm, 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 I'm even forced to say carelessness to a certain extent, uh, where, you know, if, if groups are invisible, they don't matter to them. Um, so, and, you know, this is not, this is not a myth we've seen in Myanmar, uh, you know, the, 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 the dangers and the weaponization of, of social media platforms, particularly Facebook and how, um, you know, minorities like the Rohingya Muslims were targeted to an extent where the UN even had to say, you know, Facebook might be responsible to a certain extent to, in, in a way, to what happened to the, to the Rohingya Muslims. And we know over 1 million uh, refugees are in Bangladesh because of that specific incident. So it's not, it's not something that we're imagining here. It's actually really, we've seen it. So if you look at the situation in Ethiopia, of course, it's not to say that Ethiopia is going to have a genocide anytime soon. That's not the case. But uh, the way that you know, social media is being weaponized, that's what we're seeing. So then you know, we shift away a bit uh, from, from the conversation of social media. And then we look at um, you know, uh, uh, Jeffrey and others and yourself were talking about how you know, uh, access to um, you know, a simple device is really important. Uh, you know, a mobile device and being able to register from MPESA and or mobile money is, is extremely important. And of course that is. And you know, um, so for instance, in Kenya now, if you look at um, Huduma Number and you know and this digital ID programs that are being rolled out, they have a massive, massive risk of you know discriminating against minority groups, folks that normally would not be uh, you know would not be guaranteed you know foundational identification documents. So for instance, if you look at the Nubian groups in in, in Kenya. Um, that's actually quite a heartbreaking story where, uh, you know, citizens, well, the Nubian groups have been denied citizen and now as, as governments push to, to digitalize systems, by the sheer fact that you're not able to get a, just a, like, you know, an, a foundational ID, you're discriminated against, uh, you know, accessing healthcare and many other things that, you know, when, once the systems are centralized, it becomes very difficult for minority groups to engage with them. Um, so it's not just that, it's, it's also the, the other part of this is, you know, I think for me, you know, the issue of data protection, especially when it comes to minority groups is so important. Um, in many ways, we know how minority groups can be discriminated. So uh, if, if you can mine through somebody's data and you know, figure out which ethnic group that they're in, which minority groups you know, they're in, uh, the potential for discrimination in there and the potential for you know, bad actors to misuse that information is also really um, you know, is an important discussion that we should be having. So yes, we want people to be connected to the internet. Yes, we want people to have mobile phones. Yes, you know, mobile phones you know, is important. Mobile data is really important. But uh, you know, if you can mine through the data who's a Nubian group, if you can mine through the data who's a Muslim and who's not a Muslim, right? If you can, if you can mine through the data who's an Oromo and who's not an Oromo, then you're actually, you know, that, that, that information that we've given and that technology is going to be used to web, you know, as a weapon against many individuals. And I think for us, it's important to strategize now to talk about, you know, what does data protection mean for minority groups? Um, what does digital identity mean for refugees, for minority groups that were, you know, that we know are, would most likely be discriminated? What does biometric registration mean? Uh, you know, the fact that you, you, biometric, your biometric information is being linked to your, you know, your ethnicity, what, like, what potential impacts will that have? I think that's, the, those are really critical things for me. The one last thing that I would mention here is, Especially maybe a bit going back to the issue of um, the issue of you know content moderation and you know what we see online. Um, some of the dangers that I see with that as well is like you know this this closed 
group platforms that that we all engage with um and you know and how hateful content is being pushed in in you know in, in facebook and instagram and other spaces is that um for instance you know if you look at um if you look at the Rwandan genocide and how the media has been used and, you know, how the media was one weapon, um, you know, to discriminate against, uh, you know, um, groups, uh, you know, one thing that was pretty clear was that, you know, if you and I, you know, at that time would tune into the same radio frequency, we'd be able to hear what the, you know, what the presenter would be talking about certain individuals. But now as you shift into, uh, from a public, you know, media, um, uh, an accessible media to a closed group, what we're seeing now is that, you know, um, the the content that you're seeing on your Facebook page and the content that I see are are extremely different. Um, so we don't even know what the dangers, um, you know, uh, what what dangers minority groups are faced with because these closed platforms are curated by a specific algorithm, right? So depending on what page you like, depending on who you engage with, the the hateful content that you might be seeing might not necessarily, you know, be visible for the rest of the world. So this hateful content that that we're worried about, the violence inciting content, is actually quite closed to a, to a specific group. So, uh, you know, unless, um, it, and it's very difficult for those, those two world, worlds to merge. So again, when we're specifically looking at minority groups and how they're being targeted, there's also an algorithm aspect of it. Um, you know, there's a machine to an extent, a machine coded by a human being, the machine did not code itself, uh, you know, that's propagating hate as well, which is also extremely dangerous at the same time. Um, so those are some of the issues that I would, I would definitely uh, bring up in this conversation. I'll end with that, thanks. Thank you very much, Birhan, for that comprehensive uh, analysis based on your experience. Um, very, very helpful. I'll be coming back to you later with a few questions from my side, but also from the from our audiences out there. Definitely, they have questions for you. Um, I'll now move very quickly to Olive. Olive, the executive director of the Albinism Umbrella of Uganda. What is happening, Olive, with the mobile technologies and people living with albinism? It should be an opportunity, but we are seeing a challenge. What is happening? Could you please take us through your experience? Thank you. Thank you so much, Amin and uh, Behan and the rest of the panelists. Thank you, first of all, for the opportunity. And I really want to appreciate uh, Rehan. I want to begin from where she closed off. Um, the dilemma of, uh, there is a documentary called Social Dilemmas. I don't know if some of you have watched it, which specifically talks about how all this is really controlled and artificial intelligence is being used. So knowing that what um, someone in Kenya can view and what I'm viewing, I mean, brings more scary information to, to, to each of us. Coming down to persons with albinism, we, we may or may not know that um, by the fact that we're in Africa, but even the rest of the world, we're black, yet not black enough, white, not white enough, like they've always um, labeled us for that, who we are because of that skin difference. So we face a lot Ex of Excuse me, Olive. Sorry, the, I don't know if it's with the microphone, but you're a little bit loud. If you could uh, amplify a little bit, that would be very great. Thank you. Was I louder or no? Hello? It was low. It was low, okay. Yeah, we could hear, but not very clearly. We want to hear every bit of your word. I know, I know. Is this better? Hello, is that better? It's okay. better. Okay, thank you, thank you. So I could just uh, redo for for those who may have missed a, a, a bit. I was just looking at uh, the effects of a documentary called Social Dilemma that literally says we have been wired to think or to view what we are viewing and not everybody is looking at the same information. Even when we can view on these social platforms, it's really depends on your likes. So as if we have this invisible hand controlling what we can have access to. So that alone makes the ground noise level. So moving forward to persons with albinism, 
as uh, elaborating on the issues that we face because of our skin condition. We are in Africa and we can every say that uh, Africans are black, but you find people with albinism in Africa and we have been labeled as white. You are not white enough, neither are you black enough. So the, the in-betweenness causes a lot of stigma right from family because the issues range from family neglect, then society, community, up to policy level. I need to let the viewers and listeners know that up to until 2019, in Uganda, people with albinism were never considered in any group. So how would you even plan for people who you don't even know? So you're in a group called others. Who would ever plan for others, you know, with a resource envelope that is always limited? So people with albinism have really just come on board, grouped under disability, and then right there you are not fitting enough. Are you a minority group? You are not fitting enough. So we still have the challenge of belonging. Yet this is at the core, right, when a child is born with albinism, where from the family, the parents themselves being black are not um, very comfortable saying, okay, this is my child, or, you know, especially women at the center of this challenge. But yeah, right there, uh, Albinism Umbrella, founded uh, four years ago, came on board to be a voice for people with albinism. And our mission is that persons with albinism can live a dignified life. How would you have a dignified life when your human rights are violated? What's the point? So it is at the core of what we do that our rights are respected. Um, we are included. And this inclusion, uh, many times we, we've seen governments and the policy makers talk about it. But when it comes to its implementation, it leaves a lot to be desired. Coming to what technology has done and even looking, bringing it close to the new normal we are living in, looking at the pandemic. Um, in Uganda, we had a very funny scenario, but it comes from one tweet of somebody in Zambia who said COVID-19 is a white disease. So it's the whites who have brought COVID-19. Now we are in Africa and we, we have actually as um, a regional platform where people with albinism discuss different issues. So we unanimously agreed not to react to that post so that it would not generate more information because that already is fake news, you know? As people are speculating on what the causes of COVID are, and this is uh, a few months back, of course, everybody had their view of what COVID-19 is, what corona is, and you know, it sparked off more in the Western world and Middle East. So that, in a way, yet, as much as it didn't receive a lot of attention, but um, the hate speech went down to the local communities, who may not have been on social media, but word of mouth. So I have my two friends who were walking, and they kept calling them corona white, or bazungu means white people, and they're saying those are the people who have corona. And you can imagine what that can do to stigma and discrimination. It was so bad that uh, these, two, uh, these two ladies were, they wanted to use public transport. It had been opened then, and they were denied access to that because they are labeled people who have corona just because of their skin. So it, it, is, it is so discouraging that one post can reign a whole, let's say, minority group. So that alone, you know, sparks off more stigma. And these are people who could now come out and they are actually leaders in our community. So that on themselves, you can imagine being denied access to public transport because of your skin. And why somebody imagines that corona comes from white people. So looking at technology in that angle, it really disfranchises our people. I also want to comment um, on the issue of safety and security. Um, at Albinism Umbrella, we know that there is hardly any information for persons with albinism. Globally, if I can say, it's, it's hard. It's a focus here and there. Tanzania, we really get brought on the news because of the, the high numbers of Ethiopia and the many deaths that were raised. So we're always in the media for bad news. 
And we saying ourselves in Islam Brida that can we change the narrative and and portray the good that people with albinism can 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 do or they are human like you and this is our message. Um it's still at all order, if I can say. Our counterparts in uh, Kenya, I'm sure the perception is quite, quite different. Because uh, in Kenya, they have a senator, uh, Honorable Isaac Maura, we have a judge in Kenya. It's not the rest of um, East Africa, if I can say, and the rest of Africa. Though also in South Africa, we have um, a retired uh, Namaste Onto, who is really doing vocal. But it is one or two that are really coming up to say, wait a minute. We are humans too, and we deserve our rights. So this takes a lot of effort. Why the people that we are fighting for, one, they do not know their identity. They're finding their bearing to begin with, right from the family. They're saying, okay, um, you find a father who has five children, one has a Venice man says, I have four, and this other. So that alone, um, Connect does not get a link, uh, the, the breakage is there. If you are not accepted at family level, how much more for the community? So this has gone, and, and you know the, the, the past storms, the norms, uh, we carried out a research uh, in uh, 2018, uh, in, uh, in November 2018, when we looked at different aspects of why albinism, why, what is the perception of people? And it was interesting that in Uganda, we have around 52 tribes. Each tribe has a myth, if I can call it, about albinism. And how do you begin to um, get these customs and those very seated negative roots about uh, albinism and uh, whatever they believe, the missing uh, misconceptions about this condition, that it is only sleep, just a genetic condition. So much as we're using um, technology, that it can reach just a small number. Looking at the research that has been done, Uganda has over 40 million people, and as at um, in Jan 2019, rather, yeah, 2019, Sipesa came out with a penetration of internet. There were only 18 million out of 40, not even half the population can have internet. So if you are looking at not even half, then how much more for those who even having a mobile phone is a privilege. So the penetration is not even half the country, of course, uh, with the poor connectivity. Then in Uganda, we got a setback when they introduced the social tax. That pushed the figure from, we were around 43 to 35% penetration. And like you know, this disproportionately affects the minority people who are persons with albinism. So, we appreciate technology and the good that it has done. But if we go back to how we can obtain the sustainable development goal, leaving no one behind is still a myth to most of the population that we serve. Uh, people with albinism are able, they are humans too, and this is only a genetic condition that is inherited from both parents. And I keep emphasizing from both parents, it is a recessive gene that is passed on from parent to a child and this information has to go out but i always tell people know the truth and pass it thank you very much uh, olive for that comprehensive the the volume was a little bit low but we have managed to capture most of the things that you have brought out the issues of conception or misconception about the whole condition of uh, uh, people with albinism, and also the challenges that they are facing historically, but also in the current circumstances. Time is running out. I will move very quickly to Alain. Uh, Alain, could you please um, tell us what is happening in Congo? Congo is supposed to be a very, very rich country, supplying the rest of us with all sorts of minerals and raw materials, but looks like some of the worst human rights violations are coming from Congo. And from our report, we find that uh, cobalt this time around is the issue. Could you please tell us some more? Thank you. Thank you very much, Amu. Uh, I think my volume is clear enough for everyone. Yeah. Yes, you're, you're loud, you're loud, thanks. 
Thank you. Yeah, what is happening in the Congo is what you mentioned already. The, the, the problem is you, you don't, there is no link between the minerals and uh, the population itself. And also the lack of uh, uh, good, good management in the country, across the country, especially in the eastern of DRC. You know, the most of the minerals, if not the most, but all the minerals in DRC is based in the eastern part of the country. And this is the area which had been for decades now in trouble. Different rebel groups, we have like uh, more than 120 militia groups uh, controlling different areas of minerals and also recruiting child soldiers. And behind that, you have also the poverty. For example, last year, myself, November, uh, last year I was covering uh, a cobalt issues in Katanga. Katanga is normally the headquarter of this cobalt that we are talking about even. Myself, I was surprised, for example, uh, facing some ladies under 11 uh, uh, with, with kids because they have been, uh, um, raped by by guys walking in the minerals areas you 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 out of kids or young ladies you 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 have also like women obliged to work for example in the minerals areas sometime in the in the artisanal one behind just just behind the the, the international multinational uh, companies where they cannot access or they don't feel really the impact of these minerals on their community so they have like to to bring their kids they are, uh, all their belongings working in the artisanal so that they can at least find one dollar at the, at the evening. So the risk of, of this situation is pushing those parents to leave their own uh, young ladies under 11 sometimes to go in prostitution. I can call it like a forced prostitution because they have to, to get something, uh, how they, they have to do their best to, to survive. So this is what you, 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 this is really uh, something you have between, you cannot uh, make a link between having minerals and having this situation on the ground. And unfortunately, it's really, there is no light. You don't see really uh, a solution coming. Uh, you have NGOs, for example, in Katanga, they have been trying to, 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 to court, uh, I don't know if you heard about this report, NGOs and civil society trying to call the big companies in the US, notably Apple and others, for being using label, uh, uh, to, for being using child or, or, or young ladies in, in, in the minerals areas in Katanga, but uh, uh, most of them or their parents, for example, died uh, while working for the big companies in a very bad condition without any control because these people, they have power on even on, on, on the authorities because of corruption. No one can control them. No one can check exactly what is the condition of people working there. Maybe I will file some, some photos so that we can have it on the platform, maybe on the Facebook platform. You will see young ladies, uh, uh, kids under under nine years working in the minerals area for all the day and they, they have like uh, to stay there for, for all the days so that they can get something and you see just not far from there multinational companies those who are making names in the international market working in, 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 in without any respect of any regulation or rules because only they are they are taking profit from 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 the corruption system that we have they are taking profit from uncontrolled markets or maybe competition. I don't know if you need really to talk in terms of competition because so far nothing really is organized in terms of who is doing what. It's only each person is trying. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm also having problem with, the, with my, I'm suffering a little bit, but. I, I did my best to at, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have the same issues also going on in North Kivu, for example, where you have other 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 types of minerals, but these areas facing the same issues. find kids being worked let's just say 
people being the, they, 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 they were just stuck under under the minerals in, they could not come out because they, they, they're working in a very bad condition but under the control of some big companies those who are taking or buying minerals illegally from from from, from, from the conflict area others are dealing with the group who armed, armed, uh, armed groups for example in in north Cape, myself i covered i've been discussing with different my my rebels group for example the interest of these people they are controlling big areas of minerals and the problem is they're in touch with some officers in the army or or some big multinational people they they, they really know that these people are uh, 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 the minerals coming from these areas is illegal and also it has blood as they always calling it blood minerals but as they are taking profit from the corrupt uh, corruption system in the country and also insecurity which we have been living in for a decade right now so the, 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 the you you just have like a local population without anyone to, to advocate for them or to, to, to let their, their, their voice to be heard somewhere. So the uh, people population or local population living like, uh, uh, I don't know how to qualify, but like they don't have power, you see? This is the, the big issues, what is happening with the, with, the, with the minerals in the DRC. This is why you don't see any link between the normal life of people and, and, and the, the minerals. In Katanga, where I've been covering last year, for example, you have more than 60,000 people being forced to, to, to displace from the area simply because they discover a cobalt in the area. But the condition for displacing these families with their kids is not respected. And when you, 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 you ask governors, you try to connect with authorities, people who are getting this area, they are a big company, for example, Chinese and others, they will tell you clearly that we paid for, for these people to, to be displaced. So the corruption is mostly from people who are coming to, uh, to, to, to take those cobalt or to invest in illegal in the country, but they are, they, are, they are in complicity with the corrupted system of the government. This is the, 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 main, the, 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 the main reason. Exactly the same in the area of North Kiev with the Turi from where myself I'm coming from. It's the same issues because the government is so corrupted and the local authorities are so corrupted, they don't take into consideration the living condition of people living around the, the minerals areas. And this is exactly why also the most of militia today, if you go in the eastern of DRC, the most of trouble that we have or conflict that we have, it's like a people trying a little bit to take control of themselves because they are aware that the, the area is rich. They are aware that the minerals coming from their villages is the one going on the international market, making the iPhone that we have. They are little by little informed now because of the technology that we are talking about. They can read, they can, uh, uh, they can meet with journalists, they can share their ideas. They know people are informed. Maybe the difference between what we, we had maybe in two, 20 years past and now, even those local populations, they are informed. They know that the country is rich. They are informed about the corruption system which the country is going through. They are informed about the fake politicians which are taking profit from, from, from their poverty. So this is exactly why now the most of the, those local communities, they are now trying maybe to deal with the militia groups, thinking that they can take care of their own minerals, trying to, 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 to survive also. I've been discussing with some of them in, I met, for example, women spending uh, months in the bush because they could not come out from the bush because of militia working in the minerals areas in their villages. Then when we, come, we, we, we arrived with the UN, you could see we were in front of people, they are spending like six months without proper food in the bush running from the militia dealing with the minerals in their area because the area was declared, they declared that the area uh, could be normally uh, a, a mineral extraction area. So militia jump on the opportunity. So you met women and children in a very malnutrition 
high malnutrition condition because they cannot survive in their village because of the presence of the militia. And when we are discussing with them, they are telling you clearly that we are, we are victim of our own minerals. They know that uh, uh, international market is taking profit on them. They know also that the, the international uh, uh, market is taking profit on the corrupted system of the country. But it's, it's, it's a very, a very... Yes, thank you. Situation, which, uh, yeah, helping the situation on the ground. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Elaine, for that uh, comprehensive information about the, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, definitely, there have been a couple of companies that have been implicated in uh, this whole um, human rights abuses in terms of mining resources and also in the manufacture of these uh, uh, products, the digital uh, platforms. Apple has been uh, mentioned, and I think there are a couple of conversations going on around that. Also Tesla, mm -hmm. the American car maker, is also implicated and a couple of uh, Chinese companies. So this is an issue that is out in the public. It's not something that we are going to hide about it. It's, it's been reported by several of the actors in the field. And it's such a shame that uh, children as young as nine are being used in the mining of cobalt. So that mobile phone that you're holding before you, that laptop before you, you've got to know where it's coming from that battery that is firing it, that is powering it, it's being uh, manufactured out of the labor of underage children, which is not right. So this is a serious issue. We are running out of time. Actually, our time is over, but I'll request that we have two to three minutes to hear what is coming out from uh, uh, our Facebook page. If there are a couple of questions that you want to ask some of the guests, we shall run through them, and then we shall promise to answer those questions that we shall not have answered through other platforms, like through our uh, Facebook pages, but also we shall also avail you with other platforms through which you can ask or reach us on. So Sam, is there anything um, deeply concerning that you need to bring to the attention of the panel? <laughs> Yes, we had quite a few questions come in. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for your presentations. They've just been really fascinating to uh, listen to uh, for me and for our guests. Um, I'll just drive, uh, I think for the sake of time, I'll ask one or two questions per speaker, if that's okay. And uh, for those of you who ask questions on Facebook and through email and privately, uh, we will try our best to get your questions answered by the speakers and uh, get back to you on those. So uh, for Berhan, we have one question here that says, uh, you mentioned that to a certain extent, um, sorry, you've mentioned the careless, to a certain extent, the careless approach of Facebook generally. Do you see any progress over the last few years? Uh, how can we make social networks rethink and act better on criticism? And one final question, um, is there anything we can do as individuals? Yeah, um, definitely. I would be I would be lying if we um, uh, if, if I you know if we didn't say that Facebook hasn't improved to a certain extent. To a certain extent, they have. Uh, but what you know what we're saying now is that what they what they're doing is not enough. Um, you know, the lessons for Myanmar uh, should have been you know carefully taken into consideration and should have been applied in other countries. We shouldn't wait for the next you know violence event to happen for minority groups to be targeted for Facebook to act. Um, so, you know, um, so for me, I think at the core of it that, you know, that that's the, that's the real question. Um, the idea that, you know, you can deploy your tool for the whole world without doing, uh, you know, um, an assessment of the impact it will have on minorities, the, impa the impact it will have on human rights. For me, I think that, you know, that, that whole business model and agenda is quite careless, but they've tried to improve over the years. Um, can they do better? Yes. Are they doing well now? No. Um, so, and in the way that I think we can engage with them uh, is, you know, I, I think there are many things in, in, in terms of how we can engage social networking um, groups, um, you know, in, in certain contexts, I think regulation is very important. 
um, you know, understanding how they, you know, they, they employ content moderation issues, you know, how they deal with, you know, human rights related issues is, is very important. So I think government regulation is very important, but of course, the flip side of that is a lot of the governments um, that you know that would be interested in, in in regulating Facebook also need to be regulated in how they deal with minority issues and you know they're also the first perpetrators of issues. So there needs to be a very tricky balance of like you know how do we um, how do we regulate social media platforms, but also how do we protect human rights and the, the you know the access to information, freedom of expression, and all those things. And then the question of you know what can we as individuals do. Um, to be you know and unfortunately what is true is that um you know these social me media platforms um they care about the, the profit so it's about the profit margin and what what's going to make the most money for them uh, so i think we as users need to be um you know need to also think that way right like so if, if you know big companies decide not to buy ads on facebook facebook will be forced to act because you know at the end of the day it's, it's all about the dollar and the money that they're getting um, so I think we also need to think strategically in terms of, you know, um, in, in terms of what really hurts these companies and what will make them change uh, for the better. So I, I would I would give that as an answer. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question from Lauren to Olive. Um, she says that you mentioned some of the issues for realizing the rights of persons with albinism and exclusion from accessing technology. Uh, are there also ways that technology is increasing access to rights and improving the situation for people with albinism? Uh, thank you so much, Sam. Indeed, there are ways that uh, persons with albinism who have access to technology have improved. Uh, I have some of my people, especially young people, whose self-esteem has really been boosted by being able to post something about themselves. Because uh, at Albinism Umbrella, we really emphasize self-realization and you know self-love to, first of all, boost their esteem. So that, for me, has been a very, very good tool. And also, for those who have some small work previously, who could not access certain markets, um, this I would say, that the discrimination would go as high as if somebody with albinism has something to sell, um, quite often they will not get customers. But if I'm on uh, Facebook, you do not necessarily have to say it's a person with albinism or the customer may not really care on who this is, but the product. So on a positive side, that has been good. Uh, even in interlinkages within the community have been improved and we're also using it um, as a way for safety. I didn't talk about this but we're looking at ways that we can improve our security by using technology and this is still in the formation stage but we're thinking of a safe bungle where someone under when, when they are either attacked or they've been abused in any way they have um, they are connected to a network of let's say six phone numbers of uh, next of kin that can be alerted. I just press somewhere and my next of kin get to know that, okay, something is not right. So for me, yes, technology has improved on our rights and it's also going to improve our security. Thank you so much, Olive, uh, for that really comprehensive and thorough answer. Um, I will shift to Alan. Um, we have a question following your presentation that asks, to what extent should Western countries take responsibility for the actions of corporate actors in Africa? Thank you. Uh, I think the, the simple way, this uh, has been said for several times that uh, um, Western or international community in general should normally uh, oblige the minerals, the real minerals, not the, the minerals coming from the conflict areas. This, this is the first condition normally. They, they, ne they need to be honest with, with themselves they should oblige people who are getting minerals from the ground to make sure that they're trusting where those minerals are coming from. 
and also they should be honest, for example, with the country surrounding the DRC to make sure that minerals transiting from a country surrounding the country should, from surrounding the DRC should make sure that things are from the, 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 the market which are known. But the, unfortunately, people uh, surrounding the DRC, the most of uh, people dealing with the minerals, they are not honest. They are taking profit from, from the situation which is going on in the country. And also the second, uh, um, the, the, the second recommendation or what they should do is uh, to deal with the, 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 the representation of different countries in the country, ambassadors, we are talking about ambassadors. The most of those ambassadors, they have been visiting the countries, they have been visiting the conflict areas. They know how things are going on the ground. They know how those minerals are, are, are playing a big role in, in poverty and also in conflict in the areas. So it's a matter of being honest with, with the DRC. The situation may not be good in the country, but international uh, market or international buyers may be honest. They may take action first, then the situation in the country may follow after because people are dying and victims are thousands around the, across the country every day, every month, you see. Mm. Mm. Yes, fantastic. Thank you so much. We have so many more questions coming in, but I uh, will pass those on to the speakers uh, following this call and try and get back to everyone uh, with their answers. Um, so now that we're a bit over time, I hand back over to you, Hamimu, for a wrap up of this conversation. All right. Thank you very much, Sanrawit, um, for those questions and also for the responses from uh, our speakers. Definitely, the people who ask questions, thank you very much. It means a lot. It means you've been following us, and we're very, very excited about that. Uh, because of time, I'll just do one or two recommendations from the report. And then, uh, Berhan has already been mentioned some of the recommendations, what she wants to see happening on, let's say, Facebook and social media. So we may not go back onto that. And of, of course, uh, Elaine has also given us uh, some of the recommendations. Uh, in what he needs to see happen when global uh, enterprises interact with the, with the, with the Democratic Republic of Congo. So um, Olive definitely has also told us some of the positives and what she wants to see happening more online. So from our report, we have um, two recommendations, key ones, there are very many, but one of them is uh, we need some kind of impact assessment during the development of these technologies. So a technology should, first of all, follow human rights uh, approaches to, uh, to, you know, to understand how it's gonna impact all people from those in the remotest world and also those ones who probably are physically uh, uh, not able. So we need to, the, the, the manufacturers need to take a lot of precaution there, the impact assessment. What is the impact of the technology that you're developing? That's very critical. Then we need governments in Africa, those that are procuring uh, ITs and also technologies, be them cameras, be it the regulatory you know, authorities that are uh, handling issues of telecommunications. We need you to create some space for auditing, okay? So we need to audit and understand what are these technologies? What is the impact of this technology on the masses? More so on the most marginalized. And then when there is an appeal, there should be space for an appeal from these communities that are being impacted. Those are the two key recommendations that we are asking uh, from all the key players. Definitely each one of you, wherever you are, as an individual, you have a role to play. You can start small and change the world around you. Start, for example, to educate yourself about issues of albinism. Understand very clearly that this is just a condition. It's a health condition and has nothing to do with some of the misconceptions that we are hearing. What are you doing on Facebook? What are you doing on Twitter? And what are you telling your friend who is misusing that platform? You have a role to play. Yeah, so in a nutshell, that is what we are calling out from all you people out there, the public, but also the actors, the policymakers. 
definitely technologies are supposed to empower every person. They're supposed to solve some of the challenges that we are facing in Africa. Definitely we have, everyone, almost every person has a, a mobile phone in their hand and is solving most of the challenges that uh, we have been facing. Uh, without taking much of your time, I've definitely taken some of your time. Sorry for that. Uh, I will definitely invite you to go and download the report on our website, Minority Rights Group International. The report is there. It's a very comprehensive report and there are very many case studies that you can look up and also share with the, your other networks. And also once you read that, share it. We have a hashtag, Minority Rights, rather Minority Trends 2020, it's a hashtag. Share what you have learned from us. Also share the, the report as well. That's how we're going to change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you to the guests. Thank you for your time. We don't know what we can do for you, but thank you for turning up from wherever you have been. It costs a lot to engage online, but you have found time to come. We definitely have to appreciate that. Thank you very much. And uh, I wish you the best in the rest of your, of your days. Uh, if you're in Africa, enjoy it. If you're in Europe, wish you the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.